Crippen was born Hawley Harvey Crippen in Coldwater, Michigan, to Andres Skinner who later died in 1909, and Myron Augustus Crippen who also died in 1910, a merchant. Crippen studied first at the University of Michigan Homeopathic Medical School and graduated from the Cleveland Homeopathic Medical College in 1884. Crippen's first wife, Charlotte, died of a stroke in 1892, and Crippen entrusted his parents, living in California, with the care of his two-year-old son, Hawley Otto. Having qualified as a homeopath, Crippen started to practice in New York. In 1893, Hawley Harvey Crippen married his second wife, Corrine, Cora Turner, in Jersey City, America. In 1894, Crippen started working for Dr. Munyon's, a homeopathic pharmaceutical company as a representative for Munyon's remedies. In 1897, Crippen and his wife moved to London. And although his U.S. medical qualifications were not sufficient to allow him to practice as a doctor in the U.K., he continued working as a distributor of patent medicines, while Cora, using the name Bell Elmore, had aspirations to be a music hall artist. Unfortunately, Bell had no talent whatsoever. Meanwhile, in 1899, Crippen was sacked by Munions for spending too much time managing his wife's stage career. So, he became manager of Druet's Institution for the Deaf, where he hired Ethel Leneve, a young typist, in 1900. In fact, neither Bell nor Cora was the real name of Mrs. Crippen. She had been born Konigan Makamotsky and was the daughter of a Russian-Polish father and a German mother. She was also a most overbearing and dominant character. Her long-suffering husband supported her ambitions to be first an opera singer, and when that didn't work out, she went on as a singer in the music hall but she had very little success. All she did manage to get out of her career was have affairs with several other men, make a few show business friends and garner the position of treasurer of the Music Hall Ladies Guild in London. After living at various addresses, in September 1905, Dr. Crippen and his wife took a lease on 39 Hildrop Crescent, Camden Road Holloway, London, where they took in lodges to augment Crippen's meagre income. Cora had an affair with one of these lodges. Part of the thinking behind taking the lease was that the pair could now have separate bedrooms. Bell had never really been a sexual person and according to what Crippen would later say, all physical relations between them ceased in 1907. Crippen, meanwhile, had fallen in love. The object of his desire was Ethel Leneve, the typist who worked for him. At about the same time that Crippen stopped having sex with Bell, he and Ethel became lovers. This situation continued until 1910. On the evening of Monday 31 January 1910, the Crippens threw a dinner party for two close friends of Bell's, Paul and Clara Martinetti. The meal passed pleasantly enough, except for one incident. Paul Martinetti had asked to use the toilet, and because Crippen didn't escort him upstairs to show him where it was, Bell berated him. By the time the Martinettis finally left, it was around 1 a.m. on Monday 1 February. It would be the last time that anyone saw Bell Elmore alive. Over the next week or so, people began to ask where Bell was. Crippen said that she had gone to America. As the days passed, this story was amended and now she had fallen ill. Finally, Crippen told people that his wife had passed away. There was, however, one problem with this. Ethel Leneve had started wearing some of Bell's jewelry and, by the end of February, she had moved in with Crippen at Hildrop Crescent. Friends grew suspicious and in due course those suspicions were passed on to the police. On the 8th of July, Chief Inspector Walter Jew called at Hildrop Crescent where he found Ethel alone. Crippen, it seems, was at work, so Jew visited him there and the two returned together to Hildrop Crescent where Crippen happily showed the officer around the house. He also told Jew a different story. Bell had left him for another man, almost certainly Bruce Miller, an American she had met in late 1903. Jew told Crippen that it would be better if Bell contacted him to confirm this story and Crippen said that he would place an advertisement in certain newspapers, asking for her to make contact. Things now moved very quickly. The next day, the 9th of July, Crippen shaved off his distinctive moustache and with Ethel Leneve disguised as a boy, travelled to Brussels. 
There they bought tickets for passage to Canada, traveled on to Antwerp and there boarded the SS Montrose, traveling as father and son. At about the same time, Chief Inspector Ju returned to Hildrop Crescent. He was surprised to find Crippen and Ethel missing and decided to make another routine search of the house. In the cellar he noticed some loose bricks in the floor. Officers were ordered in to make a more thorough search and beneath those bricks they found the remains of a body. The body was headless, limbless and boneless, little more than pieces of flesh, but it was female. It was time to find Crippen. Aboard the Montrose, the father and son were watched with interest. They seemed to be unduly affectionate and were constantly holding hands. Added to that, the boy's clothing seemed to be very ill-fitting. Captain Kendall had his suspicions and telegraphed a message to Scotland Yard. Jew, now determined to intercept the father and son, boarded a faster ship, the SS Laurentic, and the hunt was on. On Sunday 31 July, Jew and other officers boarded the Montrose as it sailed up the St. Lawrence. The father and son were identified as Crippen and Ethel Leneve, both were arrested, and after three weeks, were escorted back to England to face trial. It was decided that the pair should not be tried together. Crippen would face his trial first, and once that verdict had been determined, Ethel Leneve would take her turn in the dock, to be tried as an accessory. So it was that on the 18th of October, Crippen stood alone in the dock at the Old Bailey before the Lord Chief Justice of England, Lord Alverston. The proceedings would last until the 22nd of October. Crippen's defence was simple. The body found in the cellar of his home was not Bell's. The body must have been of some poor unknown person and been placed there before he and Bell had moved in. It was, therefore, crucial to the prosecution to prove that the body was Bell's. One piece of the flesh found in the shallow grave had borne a scar and medical records showed that Bell had such a scar on her lower abdomen. More conclusive was the fact that the remains had been wrapped in a pyjama jacket and a tag inside that jacket led to the manufacturers, Jones Brothers. They confirmed that this particular cloth and pattern were not issued until late 1908, proving that the body must have been placed there after that date. This, and the scar, was consistent with the body being that of Bell Elmore. Medical tests had shown that the flesh contained traces of hyacinth, a poison, and it was known that Crippen had purchased five grains of that substance on the 17th of January, two weeks before Bell had vanished. It was enough for the jury, who took just under 30 minutes to find Crippen guilty of his wife's murder. On the 25th of October, Ethel Leneve was put on trial as an accessory to murder and found not guilty. A subsequent appeal on behalf of Crippen was dismissed and his death sentence was confirmed. On Wednesday, 23 November 1910, 48-year-old Crippen was hanged at Pentonville by John Ellis and William Willis. Crippen's last request had been for a photograph of Ethel and some of her letters to be buried with him in his unmarked grave. The request was granted. However, questions have arisen about the investigation, trial and evidence that convicted Crippen in 1910. Dornford Yates, a junior barrister at the original trial, wrote in his memoirs, as Berry and I were saying, that Lord Alverston took the very unusual step, at the request of the prosecution, of refusing to give a copy of the sworn affidavit used to issue the arrest warrant to Crippen's defence counsel. The judge without challenge accepted the prosecution's argument that the withholding of the document would not prejudice the accused's case. Yates said he knew why the prosecution did this but, despite the passage of years, refused to disclose why. Yates noted that although Crippen placed the torso in dry quicklime to be destroyed, he did not realize that when it became wet it turned into slaked lime, which is a preservative, a fact that Yates used in the plot of his novel, The House That Berry Built. The American-British crime novelist Raymond Chandler thought it unbelievable that Crippen could be so stupid as to bury his wife's torso under the cellar floor of his home while successfully disposing of her head and limbs. Another theory is that Crippen was carrying out illegal abortions and the torso was that of one of his patients who died and not his wife. In October 2007, Michigan State University forensic scientist David Foran claimed that mitochondrial DNA evidence showed the remains found beneath Crippen's cellar floor were not those of his wife, Cora Crippen. 
researchers used genealogy to identify three living relatives of Cora Crippen, great nieces. By providing mitochondrial DNA haplotype, researchers were able to compare the DNA with DNA extracted from a microscope slide containing flesh taken from the torso in Crippen's cellar. The original remains were also tested using a highly sensitive assay of the Y chromosome that found the flesh sample on the slide was male. The same research team also argued that a scar found on the torso's abdomen, which the original trial's prosecution argued was the same one Mrs. Crippen was known to have, was incorrectly identified. But the scientists found hair follicles in the tissue which should not be present in scars, a medical fact which Crippen's defense used at his trial. Their research was published in the January 2011 issue of the Journal of Forensic Sciences. However, the new scientific evidence for Crippen's innocence has been disputed. English journalist and author, David Aronovich, said, as to the body being male, while the American team was using a special technique that is very new and done only by this team and working on a single century-old slide, described by the team leader as a less-than-optimal sample. Foran responded by saying, tests showed unequivocally that the remains were male. Traces of the blonde hair found in curlers at the scene are now preserved in the Metropolitan Police's Crime Museum. Another researcher says that they asked to be provided with samples from them for DNA testing, but the request has been denied several times. However, New Scotland Yard was willing to test a hair from the crime scene for a fee, which in turn was rejected by the investigators as over the top. Researchers have hypothesized that the police planted the body parts and particularly the fragment of the pajama top at the scene to incriminate Crippen. It was suggested that Scotland Yard was under tremendous public pressure to find and bring to trial a suspect for this heinous crime. An independent observer points out that the case did not become public until after the remains were found. In December 2009, the UK's Criminal Cases Review Commission, having reviewed the case, declared that the Court of Appeal will not hear the case to pardon Crippen posthumously.